Okay, welcome back to another episode of I'm in a Car. Thanks for doing this with us. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's awesome to be on the show. Thank you. Um, I've got Gliz Hamilton with us today. Um, owner and director of the Montessori School of Wellington. Uh, amazing human being. And I'm just stoked we got a chance to do this. So thanks for agreeing to it. I'm glad to be here. Despite all your nerves of being on camera, because that doesn't matter today, we're just in a car. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so in true I'm in a car fashion, would you be so kind to give us a quick little kind of Coles Notes summary of where you've kind of come from and okay. how you entered the world of entrepreneurship through Montessori and what okay. you're up to these days? Okay, well, I guess it, it started with my own children um, and particularly with my oldest daughter. Um, when she got to be about two and a half, it was clear that she needed something else. So we started looking at daycares, childcare, and nothing really blew us away until we went to this um, beautiful Montessori school in Toronto. Okay. And it was like, as soon as I stepped in the door, I knew this was what I wanted. Um, so, we enrolled her in uh, a Montessori school and um, she just flourished. Yeah. She just did amazingly well. She loved it. And um, I wanted to find out more about it. So. So you, you had never really heard of Montessori school? Well, I had. It, Montessori was always very popular in the UK. Okay, right, right. And, um, but there it was very much for affluent families. Okay, yeah, but elitist kind of? Quite elitist, yes. Right. And so, um, I did, well, then I got pregnant again and had my son. And then I got pregnant again and had my second daughter. Okay. So, when she was about three, I thought, well, this is it. I'm going to, I'm going to take the course to find out more. I had no intentions of even teaching or, right. you know, far less opening up a school of my own, but... I took the course and it was it was literally life changing. Amazing. It changed every aspect of my life. Um, how not just um, as a means of uh, educating children, but how I looked at um, myself and others, how I treated other people, and it gave me a new respect for children. Amazing. Yep. So. After I'd finished the course, I was contacted by another Montessori teacher who was planning to move from Toronto to Guelph, and she wanted to open a school. We got together, and we talked about it, and we decided that it would be a good fit. And about a year and a half later, we opened up the school. The Montessori School of Wellington? The Montessori School of Wellington. And that was in 1996? Yes. Wow. So... Um, we decided that we'd start if we got five children enrolled. So we actually got 14, oh. which was <laughs> way better than we'd anticipated. And it quickly grew. We started off with one classroom. Right. And uh, it grew and grew. And, and we took over more space. And, um, yeah, it's been... Uh, it's been quite a journey. When I think it's 21 years. It, 22 it, almost. 22 almost, yeah. It just, um, it blows my mind. <laughs> it really, uh, like, I can't believe it's 22 years ago. Yeah. But, um, well, and congratulations. There's like a very tiny percentage of businesses that make it 22 years. Yes. So hats off to you. Well, it, it sounds like a, an awful cliche, but failure was never an option. Yeah. I just never... Um, I came close one time to losing the school, and it was devastating. I realized that it was it was such a, a chunk of my life. Like that um, idea of letting it go was letting just... it go, and then I just said, "No, I'm not. I'll do I'll do anything it takes to keep it going." And we did. You know, we've had highs and lows, as every business does. Absolutely, that's the entrepreneur roller coaster, yes. right? Um, and in this business, you've got really no way of anticipating what your enrollment's going to be. Like, for example, when they introduced full day kindergarten. Oh, I remember that. I thought, well, this is this is going to hit us really hard. And 
Claire's enrollment was amazing. I wonder, that year. I wonder why. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I can't figure it out. I yeah. ask people, you know, um, like we do a questionnaire, what made you choose the Montessori School of Wellington over other options that right. are out there. And um, the majority of people say that they they just like the idea of Montessori. Right. And um, we also, about, well, exactly three years ago, we got um, CCMA accreditation. Which is amazing. Which is, yeah, it took us it took us a long time to get it. We didn't get it in our first try, um, but we did in our second. And they come out, to, unfortunately, the name Montessori was never copyrighted. So anybody can call themselves a Montessori school. And nobody can stop. Oh, wow. So CCMA is the only organization that actually comes out and, and inspects Montessori schools to make sure that they're offering the authentic curriculum, the real McCoy. Yeah. Cool. So, um, and you have to, there are certain pillars of Montessori education that you have to have in place right. in order to even apply. Like they won't come out if you're not doing the right thing. Right. Um, so we got it and we're getting reaccredited this year. Amazing. Yeah. Well done. But I'm feeling a lot more confident this year than I did well, three been, years ago. Yeah. You know? So then, what do what you? So you're up to you're getting accredited again. Um, you went yes. through that process. And what else? What else is going on with the world of Linux these days? Um, well, I've got um, my before and after school programs. Yeah. Um, at schools down in the the south side of Guelph. Oh, right, very cool. Yes, uh, Westminster Woods, yep. Sir Isaac Brock and Arbor Vista, the French Immersion School. Yeah. And uh, they're doing amazingly well. We've um, we've expanded those and we're, we're full every year. There's, there's There's a huge demand. Right. Well, there's, I guess everybody's busier these days. Everybody is. And a, a large uh, chunk of the people that live in the south side are working in, in Toronto. You know, right. they're commuting, so they, they need to have that care. Yeah. But, um, it's, uh, yeah, that's it. It gives me a, a perspective of what's happening in the public school system as well. Right, yeah, I guess it's you pretty know? different, right? It is. It's, it's very different. Um, for example, we only have, we have 15 children in a class, and, and they have 13. Right. With the same number of staff. Right. So um, it's definitely, there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one going on in the Montessori classroom. Sure. But, so, um, you, taking you back then, just quickly, you mentioned this idea that when you went through the, the program, that it kind of changed your perspective on life. Yes. It changed the way you approach, the way you treat people. Yes. Uh, gave you a new appreciation for the way children develop and learn. Right. So what was it that changed? Like, what was it about that program that changed your approach to people, not just children, but people in general, and, and how did it affect you well, in your life? There's, um, there's a lot of psychology involved in it, and a lot of the ideas are actually counterintuitive when it comes to children. Like you were saying about, um, you know, you, you see your child after they've been gone for the day, and you bombard them with a whole slew right. of questions. Right. How was your day? Who did you play with? Did you have fun? What did you eat for a snack? Did you finish your lunch? Right. And children, apart from anything else, they're a completely different time mode from adults. Like they, they're in the moment. When they step out from where they've been during the day, it's in the past. Right, right. That's why time moves slowly for children. You know, they, they talk about sleeps, and that's why your summer seems so long because you are in the moment. That's all you're thinking of. Yeah, that's um, cool. And then we lose that. I was going to say we're all trying to figure out how to get it back. How to go back there? Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's really, really difficult. I mean, I'm I'm trying it too, but oh, it's so so hard when you have to plan. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's almost. How do you plan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, the, in Montessori, we recommend that you don't ask your children any questions at all. Just express to them how happy you are to see them again. Um, uh, don't say I missed you. 
don't make it sound sad or negative and just say, I'm really happy to see you again. And then maybe start talking about something that you did during the day. Okay. It's like, um, well, you know that neighbour across the street, that silly woman. <laughs> <laughs> so you just talk about what you were doing and that might trigger something in your child's mind like, oh, I, I was talking about the same thing with somebody. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're having a conversation instead of an interrogation. That's beautiful. So, um, also not, not to help children. Yeah, I love that. These are wonderful because they're two of the articles I had a chance to, to work with you on many years ago uh, that are on the website. So if anybody wants to learn about these approaches, they can go to Montessori-School right. and check it out, um, And I've used them both, the letting kids struggle and not interrogating. Yes. So I have a three-year-old. And when I pick him up, I, I say, it's, I'm so happy to see you. I'm yes. up, really happy to see you. It's good. You know, it's great to see you. Uh, I'm looking forward to hanging out. Or, yes. You know, something like that. And and then he just... Bah, 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 bah. So what's this thing about struggle? Um, well, uh, a lot of parents feel that they should be helping the children to do everything. But instead what you're doing is robbing them of the opportunity to become independent by doing it themselves. Right. So if you, for example, if we see a child struggling to put on her shoes, I have a videotape of a child who, it, over 10 minutes she spends trying to put these sandals on and they're all strappy, you know, and she tries to put it on the floor and then all the straps fall so she can't get a foot in it. And I started filming her and um, she eventually got it. She got both feet into her sandals. She got them done, up, fastened. And she was so proud awesome. that she'd done it herself. <laughs> now, I could have stepped in. Like Easily. I would be doing, oh yeah, and, and I would be doing it for, with, with the best of intentions. Sure. But I would have robbed her of that triumph, that victory. That's cool. So that was one of the hardest parts I found, was holding back. Um, because your instinct, we're taught that you should help children. Right. You see them putting on a coat, so you, you start fixing it for them. And, right. Um, but, and that's just the beginning, because then it just stems into life situations that are actually of significance. Yes, yes. <laughs> if we don't let them win on the trivial things to right. feel the triumph and the confidence, right. then the bigger things over time yes. compound. Right. And yeah. they're, not, that's wonderful. they're not all winners. You know, we, we don't have um, prizes for the, the best redhead, you know? It's, <laughs> it's, it's part of life, is that you're going to, there can only be one winner, yeah. really. Yeah, and by definition, in a group of 20. Everybody else is a loser? Yeah. No. No. Everybody else has learned something really valuable. Yeah. So we're always telling them, um, mistakes are great. That's the only way you learn. If you go through life and you don't, Ever, you understand everything, um, then you don't really know anything. Right. You don't know anything deeply. Like I can fix printers because I would take my printer apart right. when it wasn't working. They always they all work now, but back in the day, they yeah. would break down regularly. <laughs> so I loved to take it apart and put it back together again and get it working. It was a great feeling. Sure. So well, now cool. I understand printers. But <laughs> Um, mis the right answer is is great if you can get it, but it's a process of how you get there. Cool. And then, so then taking that philosophy into entrepreneurship. Yes. Um, what have been your biggest failures that have turned into great lessons? Is there anything that comes to mind that like, man, I really hated that, but man, did it ever give me perspective. Um, I guess with staff, um, I know exactly what I'm looking for now from past failures. Sure. Um, I, I have to have staff with a certain level of uh, 
qualifications, but attitude is way more important to me. Um, I don't want somebody that walks about with a job description in their hand. You know, okay. That's not on my job description because when you're looking after children, you have to you have to think on your feet all the time. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The kids will keep you on your toes, right? Yes. <laughs> and there's so much invisible work. Like I have job descriptions for all my staff, but they have to be able to, uh, like, the book to make snag. A child needs changed. I've got to change the child. So, um, snack can wait. And it helps you to prioritize. And um, I, I used to sweat everything when I first started because I felt the responsibility of it because I was dealing with other people's children. Right. There was, I don't think there's any greater responsibility. It's a lot of weight. Yes. And so I would stress about everything and then I thought well I, I can't I can't carry on like this this is not doing anybody any good so I learned to prioritize and you know, sweat the big stuff sure that's <laughs> really important yes so I'd love to dig on two of those ideas quickly <clears throat> one of them being this idea of yeah sure there's a base level skill required mm -hmm. but attitude is everything so can you just explain that a little bit more about why it's so important? And because and, and, a lot of people are looking for experienced people with the skill to do the job. Yes. And a lot of people that I know understand attitude and how important it is, but right. I don't think people quite get how important it is. Yes. Um, unless they've maybe been in business for 21 years. Yes. And seen some situations. So mm -hmm. can you just kind of expand on that a bit? Um, well, I I want somebody who actually enjoys working with children. And there are some people out there that don't really enjoy working with children. But they've got the skills. They've got the skills. And the training. Yes. And... For some reason. I don't, uh, like, why go into this field? It's, it's very draining if you're... If you adore children, <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah. It's all give, give, give. But um, then you start, it's not all give, give. You get a lot of time. Um, but you have to appreciate what you're getting back um, to be able to continue. Uh, so I need somebody, first of all, who enjoys being with children, but somebody who is feels that they're part of a team. I don't want somebody dragging themselves to work every day. And bringing the rest of the staff down and not passing on a good feeling to the children. I need somebody, you don't need to be chipper all the time, but you need to be calm and confident. And it's contagious, isn't it? It's very contagious. And children, have they're so tuned in to their every expression. And they're more tuned in than other adults. And they can tell immediately, even if you're trying to cover it up, if you're stressed and you're trying to smile, <laughs> but you're not feeling it, uh, they pick up on that <laughs> right away. Yeah, they're sponges, right? Like, oh, yes. And just uncensored, no filter yes. sponges. Yes. <laughs> well, they don't have all the baggage that we've picked up over the years. You know, we have to try to be um, political, politically correct. Right. And... Um, and not hurt people's feelings and um, be tactful. Children don't have any of that nonsense. <laughs> yes. It's just black and white. Yeah, they, they see things exactly for what they are. They call it as they see it. Yes. That's great. And that's that's the stage that I like. I mean, some people have preferences. You know, they like working with older children. Um, I like children at the age where they haven't become self-conscious. You know, that they're still singing the bathroom. And, yeah. And Do a jig in the middle of a floor yeah. with everybody watching. Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know why they have to lose that now, and I don't know why they have to start disliking school. And it, it I know I'm terribly biased, but <laughs> it doesn't happen in the Montessori school, like in elementary programs right. and high schools. Um, they they still get out of bed in the morning. And want to go to school, 
and learn. Um, and learn and understand, not just memorizing facts and information. Right. Which is the way of the dodo bird right now, if you consider what's happening with technology and artificial intelligence. And well, to try to get human beings yes. conditioned to memorize information is no, an exercise of futility, really. There's no, there's no teacher knows as much as Google. No. I know you have to, still have to be careful, but um, it it has to change, I think. Yeah. It has to. It's it's even more important now to have the, a Montessori approach to learn, where it's all about... Um, so, for example, in, in elementary classes, they'll maybe be given a project, like, we'll find out why the colour blue is so predominant in um, ancient Egyptian um, paint, um, paintings. Sure, okay. So, along the way, they learn history, geography, the meaning of color. The meaning of where the color comes from. Yeah. It just so happens that it was a very easy pigment. Right. To, to get. To get. It was actually accessible. Yes. Um, didn't have to crush ants and yeah. do all that stuff to get the color. It was easy. So. Um, because of the vegetation or whatever was around. Right. That they right. About yes. The flora of the name yep. of the geography. And um, what grew, uh, what didn't grow, how the their art was influenced by different cultures and so they're learning something really meaningful and because it's um, it's generated by them we, we, we think of education as something we do to children right we have to educate them we have to educate them we have to give them facts fill them up with information in Montessori it's child driven so they decide how they're going to go about it. They, they'll do some um, like negotiations at the beginning. They'll discuss how they're going to handle it, and they have to learn to do it as a group. Um, so the skills they acquire are, are meaningful, and it's something that they'll they'll remember because they've done it. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Jack Ma, have you heard of him? He was the founder of Alibaba. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, he's amazing. Yeah. He's, he's been talking about education well, a lot. That's what I was just referencing. Yeah. He was talking about how um, we can't train humans to compete with computers. Right. That we have to focus on things like sport and teamwork. Yes. And compassion. Yes. And sharing and um, art and culture. Yes. Uh, because those are things that robots won't have. Right. And it's where the human condition can truly shine. Yes. And it just seems like Montessori's been doing that for decades. It's been doing that for a hundred years. <laughs> yes, century. And it's, it, because it's all based on observations of children, every other form of education is what a group of adults think children should learn. Um, but Maria Montessori actually just observed children because she didn't want the job. She was very reluctant. She wanted to be a doctor. She was a doctor. Right. But she had no patience because she was female. Nobody would go to her. Oh, I thought you meant she was just like frustrated. She had no patience. No, no. Oh, no, 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 no. She no, physically no. didn't have any clients Sorry, or patients. No clients. Yeah, yeah, got it, got no, it. No sick people. <laughs> so um, she took this on just as something to do and she approached it as a scientist. So she didn't know anything about children, so she decided she would study them and observe them. And then she started introducing things for them to do. And she Stimulus. started off with games and toys, and some were rejected, some were kept, some were modified. And then she found that they were getting bored. So she started introducing academics. But Montessori is not about academics. It's about social development. That's wonderful. Um, like academics get you through school, but social, if you've got social skills, that gets you through life. Yeah, so I, that's, I want to come back kind of full circle to what you said at the beginning of our ride. When you said you took this program, it, it changed you in the way you approach everybody. Yes. Not, not just children, but the way you show up in life and the way that you treat your peers, your yes. the other adults around you. So what was it there? that change? What was the perspective that you go? Um, I think I became a 
lot more patient with people. And so I'm really I'm working on that right now every day. So can you just hit me up with some how on the patience? Well, if you if you understand where somebody's coming from, um, which can be difficult because I find that very sensible, level-headed people become different creatures when it comes to the children. They become like <laughs> rabid animals sometimes. Yeah, it's weird because it's so visceral um, and reason flies out the window sometimes so you have to realize this and not not take it uh, personally they're not getting at well sometimes they are <laughs> um, it's usually just uh, it's a reaction it's not a response it's just a gut reaction to um, protect wanting to protect their child so um, you, you have to learn how to stay calm and uh, and talk it through and so it's given me, I think, a better understanding of, of where people are coming from and, and what generates this feeling. That's cool. Have you heard of, I, I don't know if this is the, the right way to say her name, but it's Dr. Sherifati. I think it's Sheila Sherifati. Have you heard of this one? No. Anyway, don't kill me if I got the name wrong, but if you were to Google something like Dr. Sheila Sherifati phonetically, you would find the, this okay. person. Um, but she had a couple of comments, and she, so she's a specialist in family counseling. Right. And uh, one of the things that she said at the very beginning was that the, all these parents, all these rich parents, drop off these kids to get counseled at three hundred dollars an hour, and within eight minutes, she knows that the kids are just perfect kids, and that it's all the parents' oh. issues. Yes. But she also realized that if she told all the parents that all the time, then she would have an empty room because yes. they'd never come back. Yes. Uh, but she she goes into one of the things that you mentioned that made me think of this was this idea that. You know that visceral reaction that someone that you are experiencing when someone gets involved with something going on with their kids. Yes. Um, and she talked about the city of judging. Don't judge the afflicted. Judge the affliction. Yes. Which I thought was a really neat mm -hmm. idea. Right. That it's like the human condition. Right. More than it is Dave and Joanne. Yes. And I think that kind of helps with that idea of patience. That hey, oh. Hey, it's showing up again. Here's, right. here's the human condition right. in front of me. Mm -hmm. It's not Dave and Joanne yes. angry at Glynis. Right. Um, which was really, really cool. So I just thought that was uh, a very like uh, pointy part. And she talks a little bit about how the reason for it is because a lot of times the parents will get emotionally wrapped up when they see their kids doing something they don't like in themselves. Yes. Yes. That really pushes your buttons if you see that, and it's a combination of um, mainly guilt. You're feeling guilty, shame, or and and shame, yeah. and um, you're mad at yourself. But you don't even know it. Like it seems no, like no, so many people no, are you, so unconscious. You don't, you don't figure all that out logically <laughs> in the heat of the moment. You know, <laughs> you you you're too upset. But um, yeah, it, and understanding that really really helps when you're dealing with. Um, with adults, with parents. And the same applies with staff, you know? If they feel they're not being heard, and if they feel that their um, their ideas are not being put into practice, then they can get very upset. So you have to you have to be diplomatic and, and kind. And patient. And patient. It's not easy. It's not, it's a, it's a test, but um, it's a good test, I think. And so have you found over the time that it's kind of like a muscle? The more you practice, the better you get? Definitely. Definitely. But the first outbreak I had from a parent, I was shaking. Right. I felt so attacked. Right. And I took it personally. Because it used to be if anybody said anything negative, it was like a dagger in my heart. Right, right. Well, the it was top your of school. My business. Right. You know, it was just, you know, please don't say those <laughs> kind of things. But now I know that I have an understanding of where a lot of it is coming from, I'm able to stay reasonable and, and logical and, uh, and talk things through. And now I look on, if I do have any of these encounters, I look on it as a challenge. I think, well, how can I handle this and, and have a good outcome? That's cool. So it... Um, just the thing about you know making mistakes and learning from them and and being okay that 
they all perfect. Yes. Except for the feeling. Forgive yourself. Right. Yes. <laughs> you have to forgive yourself. But the more you do it, the less you have to forgive yourself. But you, you get better at it. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Yeah, okay. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye.